Hi, Beth. Voice is good. We'll be live in a minute. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay, we are streaming live this presentation to Centennial Plaza in downtown Canton. So I'm just trying to make sure that we have that coordinated with them on the screen because he just said it said live in 11 minutes so i told him to refresh so just give me just a moment if you would Okay, he says we are good to go. So, here we go. This is the Butterfly Effect and Transformative Realities is the name of this presentation. And so if you can zoom in on the screen, get a nice square um, full screenshot so that uh, people in downtown Canton can see all the slides. That would be wonderful. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today here in Virtual World's Best Practices Education Hearth location as well as in downtown Canton in Centennial Plaza. And this is a first. Uh, hey, there's Ava, <laughs> my sister in all. Happy to have you join us here. My partner and heart's coming together. Um, and uh, my reason for being in Second Life, really. So thank you for joining us, Ava. 
And uh, as you can see on screen, that is Centennial Plaza in downtown Canton, Ohio. And this is a first for Canton, Ohio, and I believe for Virtual World's Best Practices in Education to be live streaming to a large screen in the real world. So, and this is just the beginning. We hope to do this, uh, these kinds of presentations um, in the future in Centennial Plaza and to engage uh, people in a growing story, which I, I'm going to talk about here a bit. So thank you to Pat Wyatt. I hope you can hear me, Pat, and for uh, your support and for everybody that's watching in Canton. And uh, thank you to Virtual World's Best Practices in Education, which I love so much. So uh, let's go to where the story started for a moment. This is Nimasilla Park, which is uh, actually the oldest park in Canton. Um, it uh, was where Eugene Debs was the railroad union organizer, gave a famous anti-war speech in 1918, June 16th, 1918, that led to the formation of our American Civil Liberties Union. So it's a very, uh, very important park um, in relation to the history of our, uh, the United States and really the world. And it happens to be on the OJ's Parkway. If anybody knows the OJ's, have you ever heard the song Love Train, anybody? By the OJ's? People all around the world, join hands, start a love train. Well, the OJs are from Canton, and Nimisola Park just happens to be on the OJs Parkway. So I have a question for you. This is the uncommon realities question of the day. What is history? And if you have an answer to that, you're welcome to, uh, to text it in. Um, but my answer would be that it is only what we are aware of and we choose to recognize. There are lots of things that happen um, throughout you know, time, and, but that we are not necessarily aware of so that we, we can't really recognize it as our history. But I think that if we can be more conscious of um, that fact, that we can choose our future history. So I want to talk a little bit about some things that have happened and the concept of the butterfly effect, of course, being that a butterfly on one side of the world can create waves on the other side of the world and how that's literally happening in a way through our, uh, through what we've been doing in the virtual worlds in Second Life and what started in Nimisola Park um, with the Ulster Project youth from Northern Ireland when they planted this garden on July 13th, 2010 to represent infinite peace. And in 2018, an amazing sunflower tower grew there. That's what I call it because most sunflowers have a bloom at the top that faces the sun. Well, this sunflower tower had blooms from the bottom to top facing in every direction. So um, we decided to actually just spread these seeds around the world. But I want to talk a little bit about the Infinite Peace Garden itself because it has over time really become an environmental science laboratory where you can sit on that bench and have a really intimate observation of nature that doesn't seem to be bothered by you sitting there. Uh, I've seen things that I've never seen before sitting on that bench. And so a lot of what I'm going to share today are photos that were taken in that garden that are part of my immersive exhibit called the Butterfly Effect. And as they say, we're spreading seeds from this garden around the world, quite literally. And uh, if you would like some actual seeds to plant in your own garden, uh, you're welcome to DM me uh, an address to send them, and I will do that. Otherwise, we also have a way to spread them in the virtual world. And you see that big box over there uh, with uh, the picture of the sunflower tower on it. If you click on that, it will give you lots of gifts of from the Infinite Peace Garden, including the T-shirt the that I happen to be wearing here today. And... Uh, and a sunflower tower that you can place on your own sim and some landmarks and uh, note cards and other 
information as well. So Cedar Point Amusement Park actually allowed us to plant some sunflower tower sprouts under the corkscrew roller coaster in uh 2009 or no wait 2019 i'm sorry <laughs> before the pandemic hit and this picture that you're looking at now is actually part of cedar point's 150th uh 150 year atlas and chronology called rolling through the years and so it's like that concept of infinite peace and solar energy spiraling out to the world and um, and quite literally uh, around the world where video of this scene we know has been seen in at least 46 countries so far and through Second Life um, actually has made it around the world you know in in many ways and you, here you see a picture of a friend of mine um, in Indonesia uh, with the seeds that she received and she actually worked at the Indonesian National News Agency when that picture was taken and the Indonesian National News Agency is called Antara which is where the butterfly effect actually resides in Second Life on an island called Antara, interestingly enough. So there are a lot of serendipities that, uh, that are a part of this story and uh, quite miraculous. Um, I'm going to try and spin around here so I can see this picture better and read it to you. Um, but this was, we actually celebrated our second anniversary of the butterfly effect on 11-11-22. And uh, the butterfly effect is an immersive, entertaining, educational experience of imagination therapy. And you can fly on a butterfly, or an owl, or a dandelion to make a wish. And every photo has a story showing evidence of interspecies communication and messages in nature, symbiosis, and phonology studies. Really amazing revelations, I feel. Um, in understanding our relationship with with nature, uh, so this is the the landing point, and you uh, when you come in, you your first encounter is with a crab, that uh, sometimes you know gives people that that feeling of fear at first, um, and, but it's then they realize that the 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 crab is really not that crabby, <laughs> and they're just there to greet them. But it's kind of where you you need to start because you have to get past that fear to then see things differently and uh, the exhibit really is about seeing everything through eyes of love and some people would say that you know love changes everything and i like to think that it actually just allows us to see things as they truly are so uh, you could fly on that butterfly if you come to the island but on the other side of that butterfly is a picture and has anybody ever seen the never-ending story Has anyone seen that movie? Yes, okay. So if you have, do you see Falcor the Luck Dragon in that that picture? Because that picture was actually taken in a fountain in downtown Minneapolis. And it's really amazing. It's just splashing water. So how do you capture Felcor the Luck Dragon in a fountain? But what does Felcor represent? The never-ending story. And I actually use that photo, and we're talking about messages in nature here, um, at a city council meeting where they were talking about fracking. And, you know, in reference that, you know, the never-ending story is wherever we have clean water to continue to live. So quite amazing that Felcor was captured in a fountain. And if you go to the island, you can actually walk out over these rocks and something kind of miraculous happens there where you walk out into the air and then you looks like you're standing on Felcor the Luck Dragon. You can take a picture and some people actually tell me they get chills when they, when they do that. <laughs> so, um, and you know, the movies, if you've seen the movies, there's three movies and the first one the boy is reading the story. In the second one, the story is writing itself. And in the third movie, he realizes he has to write the story to save Fantasia, which is crumbling from lack of imagination, basically. 
So imagination is a really important factor in uh, in reality. And you know, and as Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. <clears throat> it's interesting to note that caterpillars use what are called imaginal cells to become a butterfly. And so I think that that's where we are in the world and say the past couple of years was the second movie, like, you know, the story writing itself and that we need to be conscious of to utilize our own imaginal selves to rewrite reality. Imagination is necessity, necessity, never spills or goes extinct. <laughs> Share a cup with us on the islands of whimsy in secondlife.com. And whimsy is one of the first places I encountered in Second Life. It's still one of my favorite places, if not my favorite place um, in Second Life, if you've never been there. And uh, you might meet Nessie, the Loch Ness Monster, who has become my friend. This is Jules. Uh, she is the founder of... Viridian Gallery, and I had a note card open to share something that she had said, and now I can't find it. <laughs> so maybe I won't be able to do that. But uh, actually, I think it's in the note card that's in the box, so you can read it there. Oh, no, here we have it. Here you go. This is what Joel said about the exhibit. So when you go into the gallery, you uh, it's called the butterfly eye effect, touch of light at the edge of the world. So you actually kind of walk through that touch of light when you're on your way into the gallery. And the two pictures on the front of the gallery are called touch of light, this one here, and edge of the world, this one here. You see the ant perched on my pinky and both of those pictures were taken on 11 11 2010 so the butterfly effect exhibit in second life actually opened on the 10th anniversary of the day those two pictures were taken on 11 11 2020 pretty miraculous um, synchronicity I feel so um, I want to thank Electra Panther, by the way, who is uh, from Italy, and she is my transcriptionist today, and I always add an I to that word, <laughs> transcription, um, but I really thank you, Electra, for being here. She's actually uh, transcribed for me uh, before when we did a tour of the butterfly effect uh, for an immersive experience at the uh, a past virtual world's best practices in education. When you walk into the gallery, you walk over these words, and what they say, I thought I had in here, and now the, the uh, picture seems to have disappeared. <clears throat> but it's a quote by Patanjali, and I have quite a relationship with nature, and it used to even freak me out sometimes until I actually read this quote and what it says is that if you become steadfast in your abstention of thoughts of harm directed toward others all living creatures will cease to feel enmity in your presence meaning they won't see you as an enemy and this is pretty much my experience all the time so this is really what the butterfly effect is about it's a lot of my own just encounters with uh, nature in in all its forms and, uh, and the messages that they give me, I just, I really feel that everything is speaking, you know, whether it be bugs, birds, clouds, water, um, if we're open to see what it is saying. And through my photography, um, they give me messages. I'm kind of their messenger. And I, just looking at the pictures, um, the stories then tell themselves through me. So uh, each frame in the gallery has a different theme. The first one you'll encounter uh, is just pictures of my timeless watch and the many critters that have happened across it over the years. And I literally wear this this watch. It doesn't have a face. Someone asked me at a coffee shop once, what's wrong with your watch? And I said, nothing. And they said, well, how come it doesn't have any time on it? 
I said, well, because there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so because it really is about being in the moment and understanding that nature gives us the greatest gifts when we spend an unmeasured amount of time and experiencing it. And it's not a matter of how long it is. It's just a matter of when you just, you know, let go of that, uh, that focus on having to be somewhere else, you know. So um, I want to share a couple of photos and stories with you. This one, uh, this caterpillar that you see on the rose was actually on my mom's shoulder. Um, and, and I, I took it off, put it on the rose and I said, it's a good sign. Trust me. And I had no idea what was about to transpire, but I took it over and handed it to uh, Amy, uh, our friend who was in a drum circle in the park that day. And she took it and held that. That's actually her holding that rose down to this butterfly pen that she had pinned on her purse that I had given her the last time I had seen her. And the caterpillar crawled right over that butterfly pen to mirror the swallowtail of the butterfly. Amazing. Especially because that is a gypsy moth caterpillar, which is often perceived as a pest and that, you know, people use pesticides to, um, you know, try to eradicate. But we really can't, you know, spray pesticides for one species and affect and and expect that it's not going to affect another and it's interesting that dna tests have shown us that all butterflies are descended from a little brown moth so we often don't give the same value of life to a moth that we do a butterfly but that picture to me says it's all the same dna so think about that and the next picture is a really good example of timelessness and the gifts that nature gives us when we share uh, a timeless moment with it. That caterpillar uh, was hanging from a thread that I couldn't even see. It was just dancing around in like midair and I was photographing it and then it disappeared and I, oh, where'd it go? And I realized it fell and I followed it with my camera and just, you know, I photographed it, spent quite a, some time with that caterpillar before it eventually gave me that smiling face on that heart-shaped blossom. And now here's the real miracle. If you look close, the shadow of the blossom is like the swallowtail of the butterfly. Can you see that? And that is a gift of timelessness. I think it's a really great example. So here's one of my slug friends who I actually got to know over about three years time on my grandmother's front steps. And there's lots of stories to tell about them. If you come and take a tour, I'll share more. Um, but we have a lot to share today, so we're gonna move through somewhat quickly. But you can always ride a slug while you're in the, in the exhibit. And they're actually the fastest slugs <laughs> you'll ever encounter. You can race them actually around the gallery if you like, and try not to run into anything <laughs> and uh, if you see that spider in the background there that's an, an orb weaver spider that actually inspired me to spread the seeds of infinite peace around the world and weave them into a world wide web <laughs> so like I say everything is a messenger that little spider on my fingertip uh, is a jumping spider that I named yo-yo and there's a video in the gallery that you can watch of him. He actually played with me for like over an hour. And I really think that if jumping spiders want anything to be known by humans, it's that they just want to play. So consider that next time one comes to visit you. This is just one of my favorite pictures of relationship with nature. To have a damselfly just sit in your hand that peacefully is is really a remarkable experience. And that was in Nimasilla Park. A lot of these pictures, of course, were taken there. Um, this is an amazing revelation that I have to share, and I feel really, uh, really privileged and honored to be able to have this platform to, to share these things, because we've learned so much from the Infinite Peace Garden um, in studying, uh, you know, what happens there over the years. So I call it a harmony garden, because it's a mixture of human planted 
flowers, and naturally growing plants. And so this particular plant, I almost pulled the year um, I first saw it. And I thought, no, I'm going to let it go, see what it does. So it ended up revealing itself to be an attractor of Japanese beetles that then feast on its leaves and don't touch anything else as long as it's present. Um, so I think that's an incredible revelation, you know, instead of using pesticides to realize that uh, we just, if we just give them what they want, they're not going to bother anything else. So if you have trouble with Japanese beetles, plant a row of this. And does anybody know what the plant is? Before I tell you, it's kind of interesting because it's called the Pennsylvania smart weed. <laughs> And that's it. So, um, and it's really easy to grow. In fact, you know, I thin it in the garden and pull it up and I just stick it in a bucket of water. It'll live forever. And so it's really easy to transplant and, you know, you know, to give to other people if you want to. And it has really tiny little black seeds. Um, this is what it looks like when it blooms. And so if you have trouble with Japanese beetles, let me know and I'll send you some Pennsylvania smartweed seeds, or maybe you can find some on your own. So we've also learned of a multi-tiered symbiosis uh, with the sunflowers. The sunflowers actually, um, I noticed on the back of the leaves one day that the ants were doing something curious. And so I started photographing and videotaping them. And there's a playlist, and I believe the, the link is in one of the note cards, or you can come to the gallery and see it. But what has happening is there's these little tree hoppers that attach themselves to the back of the sunflower leaves. And then the ants, they secrete like a sap from the sunflowers to feed the ants, who then protect them and the sunflowers. So, and we wouldn't have learned this, you know, had that sunflower not grown there. Um, and, you know, that we were, have been observing um, these things happening in this infinite peace garden, which has become so much more, um, you know, about peace in ways that we didn't really even anticipate when it was first planted. So that's another remarkable revelation, I feel. Um, here we are looking at a picture that was just a blurred image that was part of my exhibit at the Empire State Building years ago um, called Perceptions. And the idea being that everyone sees things differently and that's what makes us all alike. So I'd like to ask around the room, what do you see in this picture? And in Centennial Plaza too. Pat, you can, uh, you can text me if you like what you see. <laughs> Pat White is the director of Centennial Plaza. And this is if really a first, but actually a second, because we actually did our first virtual broadcast in Centennial Plaza on September 16th, when we had a celebration to uh, honor the OJs and uh, lift up the Vision to Love train. Cheryl Ann Hawk actually played there virtually in avatar form from her studio in Pittsburgh on the big screen in downtown Canton. A rolling chrysalis. I like that. That's a nice perception. Beth, anyone else? I see a phoenix. Oh, I like that. Thank you, Aquarius. Haven't seen you for a while. I think you're, there might be a picture of you in this presentation somewhere. If you toured the exhibit, you might see yourself. A dog's head. <clears throat> okay. So I have actually heard thousands of different perceptions. Dog is the most common thing said. If you ask a room of 10 people, you might have four dogs. Once I went into a veterinarian's office and everyone said dog. <laughs> but I've heard everything from parachute out of the back of a dragster, uh, a bride and groom on their wedding night rolling on the floor with a bottle of champagne beside them, a tumbleweed, a storm, an eagle, a rose, a wad of toilet paper on a snow sled. <laughs> and Ava, when I first met her, the very first day we met in person, she said, the fastest snail ever. <laughs> so whatever you see, there's no wrong answers. That's the idea is that we all do see things differently, and that's how the puzzles cut. We need those different perceptions to 
make the world what it is. So to show you a little bit about how I see the world and, you know, just being aware, um, what do you see in that picture? Anyone? A smiley face, yes, of course. And so what's interesting about that smiling face is that it's an arrow. And so if you look at the arrow, it's passing the locked eye and pointing to the open eye, which I think is very relevant to, you know, really being open to seeing uh, what's in front of you. But sometimes looking at things, you know, does anybody really know what it is? This should be the question. So I'll just switch to the next picture and show you that it's the symbols on a washing machine door to show you which way to turn the knob upside down. <laughs> so sometimes looking at things upside down reveals things uh, that you might not have been aware of otherwise. And our eyes actually do see upside down. What's on the back of our retina is upside down and then our brain flips it around. So sometimes you might want to just look at things upside down and see if you see it something else. So here, this, we call this picture Rapture Bridge. And we're heading across Rapture Bridge. Um, and I, when I say rapture, I mean like the rapture of awareness that allows you to take a picture like that. You know, if you think about the circumstances that make a picture like that, it's pretty miraculous that to have to be in exactly the right spot and the sun be in exactly the right angle and and the lens that you just happen to be using and everything that makes an array of light like that possible and then to be able to capture it you know is is rapturous to me so i call that picture rapture bridge and if you come over to the exhibit and you cross rapture bridge you come to a place where you find rainbows and uh pictures of the infinite peace garden and um, and it's interesting that what, if you can read that quote, I'll spin around here and see if I can read a bit of it for you, but it says, there is a truth in the prophecies of the rainbow and the rainbow people, people from all of the Americas will unite with people from all the other nations, and they will realize that we are all family, brothers and sisters. And I think that's what we're doing here right now. This is an international conference. And, you know, what happens in Canton is actually reaching around the world and then reflecting back. And that is quite literally the butterfly effect and, and what I feel the rainbow represents and, and everyone coming together in this awareness. So as you come down this corridor, you uh, if you know what is found at the end of rainbows often <laughs> and you have learned now about the guardy ants I call them so if you know what the guardy ants protect then you should be able to find the treasure chest in the exhibit that actually contains the gifts of infinite peace that are in that same box there that you can get here today and it's really interesting because we're talking about the love train and the OJs and all of that stemming from Canton, Ohio. The song, Love Train, says, tell all the folks in Egypt. <laughs> and so very, very interesting serendipity that Olive Tree Lighthouse, my conference mentor, is in Egypt. <laughs> And she was actually the first person to find the treasure chest in the butterfly effect exhibit. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I mean, it, it just really, you know, gives, um, you know, real evidence, I think, to the value of virtual worlds. And some people don't really necessarily understand what we're doing here, but that we can make these connections, that it's not about being impersonal and about escapism. It really is about expanding our in-person uh, experience by, you know, um, not having boundaries, really, to be able to connect with somebody in Egypt or 
uh, wherever we're all from is is really remarkable. And I, I have friends all over the world that I've made during the pandemic and, you know, that we've shared uh, experiences in the butterfly effect together. And uh, the, the coasters kind of look like big caterpillars, don't they? <laughs> Oh, Mary Lou, she wears that t-shirt so well in the treasure chest is that's one of the things you can find in that box right here beside my big monarch. Um, you can have a shirt like mine and that uh, Mary Lou was wearing actually when she did her presentation here yesterday. She wears it so well. So what do you see in this picture? people in Canton should know. <clears throat> Looks like a heart, of course, in Ohio. Yes, right, Dale. Um, it does remarkably look like Ohio, and if it is Ohio, then that sprout is coming right up from Canton, Akron area. The sprout of hope, as uh, Ava said when she first saw this picture. This picture is so, or this image, she said, is so hope inspiring it's excruciating and i really believe that i believe that canton really has a uh, a remarkable place uh, in the world and and in in future history you know in in really realizing what it means to be the heart and that the heart neglects no part of the body and then when the heart does what it does and you know the body circulates everything back through the heart so that actually became the logo of Hearts Coming Together, and we had a conference in Canton, Ohio in 2007 based on this question. What will we do to change our world today with emphasis on will do today? <laughs> the Amish build barns in five hours, so what can we do, you know? And that was really the premise of the, the conversations that we had at that conference. So I'd like to ask around the room, what do you think? What would be your answer to that question? Anybody have an answer? No? Okay. Be kind. There you go. Stop fighting over nothing. There you go. Stop fighting over anything. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Very good. As this quote right here says, which was actually part of our exhibit at uh, Virtual World's Best Practices in Education last year, if we adopt the same collaborative mindset and practices that got us to the moon and back and that built the International Space Station, we can alleviate poverty and do much more. Ron Guerin, astronaut, said that. So out of our conference, since Canton is the home of the OJs, and I was always really inspired by the song Love Train, we actually started the Love Train, quite literally, on with the Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Railroad and the cooperation of the president of the railroad at the time, whose name was Steve Waite. And uh, if you look at that picture, it's just such a beautiful blend of diversity in age and in just, you know, uh, mixed heritage and just, just really everything that I think we want the world to be. And people that were a part of that, that ride really are still connected in the energy that we shared that day. When I run into this, you know, people that were a part of it, um, they, they still greet me in the same way, like we're still on the train. We all really were at a much higher vibration when we got off the train than when we got on. And the real concept of the butter, or the, uh, the love train is to ultimately have a train that's traveling from community to community, engaging communities in what I call rapid trains formation, and, um, and changing the world, you know, quickening the pace of really achieving our, our, our goals in the world all the things that we keep complaining about, just a movement of proactivity, just to be, um, just to be brief right now. Because the world 
is a broken reality. And this is a great book if you uh, want to read uh, by Jane McConigal. Reality is Broken, How Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. And I think that's what we are using Second Life for. It's not so much of a game, but I think that, you know, we can think in that gaming sort of mindset to apply that to real world problems. And that's really what the book is about. If you look at this picture really right here, you see the tracks between reality and the virtual world, you know, but there's a break there. And what we're doing is really building those bridges in the metaverse, you know, connecting ties uh, across worlds. And uh, and you see that mural there. It's just, you know, it's another thing that we can do to uh, enhance our environment. And that Love Train mural was uh, started by uh, one of our city council persons, uh, Brenda Kimbrough, uh, and her neighborhood association. And... Um, and it needs to be finished because it hasn't been yet. But that's, you know, it's a wonderful project actually in bringing people together. So I've often said that my greatest challenge is crossing the bridge of words between vision and reality. So when that's the case, trust that a caterpillar knows the way to transformation. <laughs> and if you look at those pictures, those were actually someone else's notes, and that caterpillar was on my shoulder, and they didn't see it the way that I did. They said, oh, there's, there's a ooh, there's a ooh on your shoulder. <laughs> and I was like, oh, cool, and I got him on my finger, and then I, I had the hardest time getting it off my hand, and I finally got him onto the table, and he crawled across her notes, and if you look at the picture in the bottom uh, left, the message is very clear. Use the song that gives the train love amazing isn't it and then with the butterfly on the railroad tracks so last year we here with virtual world's best practices in education created the hearts coming together space time story bridge as a literal bridge between worlds where the story of the love train and canton and the infinite peace garden were shared on this virtual bridge where the train was floating in space. And uh, it was really amazing experience to be able to meet with people there. And even Ava's uh, mom, you see there in the picture. And, uh, and one of the most amazing things that happened there was getting a message one day from Tori, who's in Ireland. And she sent me a message and said, Eclectic, you have the Phoenix Peace Fountain in your storybook. That's my hometown. And so isn't it incredible, really, that this space-time story bridge literally connected a, a loop in, you know, this, this space-time story loop between Canton, where the Infinite Peace Garden was planted by kids from Northern Ireland, and then on the space-time story bridge was able to connect with someone from Ireland who said how much it meant for her to see that in the book, that she, you know, was a child of uh, the turmoil in, in Ireland and, uh, and how much the Phoenix Peace Fountain meant to her, which is actually made of melted gunmetal from Canton, Ohio. Incredible, incredible loop. And that that connection could be made here in the virtual world is just amazing. Have you ever heard the song, Sowing the Seeds of Love? by Tears for Fears? Well, I say that it's a reality. It's not a fantasy, and I think that they were actually inspired to be singing about the seeds that we are spreading around the world from the Infinite Peace Garden, which happens to be on the OJ's Parkway in the origin city of the Love Train. Because the song talks about Love Train rides from coast to coast, and every minute of every hour, I love a sunflower. And I believe in love power, sowing the seeds of love. Einstein said time was a circle and that uh, future events could affect the past. So we have to wonder about that one because I had not even heard the song until I decided to spread those seeds. Uh, so it was a forehead slapping moment for me the first time I did. People seem to really enjoy the Mars Garden. <laughs> and uh, I had to share that because... Actually, the Mars rover is rolling on an innovation called the tapered roller bearing, 
which came from Canton, Ohio. In fact, the whole modern world. Every car, train, plane, truck, car, all over the world is rolling on in this innovation, including the Ringling Brothers circus trains, <laughs> which I actually followed for the last three months before they closed because I saw how they could repurpose their tour. And they just wanted out and didn't really want to talk. But that's the model. If you can imagine, instead of having the animals and this huge logistical weight that you don't have to worry about, what else can we put on that train? Habitat for Humanity, maybe, and uh, artists to engage communities in collaborative murals and gardeners to help with urban gardening and solar experts and recycling experts and so on and so on. And as it continues to roll, I just think it will pick up, you know, more and more momentum and and people you know excited to change the world and share the wisdom that is growing around the world so contemplate that because that is a real goal and if you've ever seen the little engine that could this is very much like a real representation of the little engine that could where we have an abandoned train station in canton circumstances have led to and it's been that way for 10 years so it's one of the reasons i came into second life is to utilize this platform to grow the story of the love train and reflect it back into reality so if you look at that picture and just kind of get that in your mind with the train and the other characters in the clouds and now look at this next picture that i took in a park here called sippo park which i call perception park what do you see above the trees? Do you see the little engine that could? And it's interesting that could and cloud are the same letters. Hmm. <laughs> and this is Canton's clock tower. The angels of the four winds. And so I have to ask if you've heard the song Calling All Angels... Is it coincidence that it's by a band called Train? Oh, I like that. <laughs> and, uh, and that Pat Monahan of Train actually sang the national anthem at the Football Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio in 2007, which was the same year that we had our first Hearts Coming Together conference in Canton that launched the Love Train. Interesting connections in space-time, I must say. Anybody ever see a football cloud before? <laughs> do you think maybe it's telling us something? <laughs> what do you think, Pat? <laughs> Pat in Centennial Plaza. So here I am, juggling worlds. Juggling, juggling, juggling worlds to help Canton see its place at the center of the universe. <laughs> and so if you've seen the movie Tomorrowland, I really think that that's where we are right now. Like the movie's about the world coming to an end and it, we've even given it an expiration date and it doesn't seem like anybody can stop it. But it's really about finding the dreamers, the people who can see beyond the negative broadcast that's dumbing everybody down to realize a new reality. So this is a quote from the movie, have you ever wondered what would happen if all the geniuses, the artists, the scientists, the smartest, most creative people in the world decided to actually change it? Yes, I have, and that's what we're talking about. And so if you've seen the movie and how the girl like picks up the pen and ends up in the field and can you imagine what it was like for me when I found this at a place called the Far Away here in Second Life? <laughs> very, very Tomorrowlandish. And that's what I really think that Second Life is. It's a way for us to um, <clears throat> put our imaginal selves on steroids, so to speak, you know, and really uh, charge them so that we can be more powerful and actually you know, utilizing also our mere neurons that, you know, are, I think, directly connected to imaginal cells. Uh, mere neurons, you know, allow us to learn how to talk and um, 
express ourselves and imagine ourselves maybe kind of in a reverse kind of reflection are what allow us to change the world. So consider that and let's go find those old tracks. Here they are. There's our abandoned train station in Canton, Ohio. The Lincoln Highway station where we actually started the love train. The origin station of the love train. And those lyrics by Van Halen, I think, say everything. Run, run, run away like a train running off the tracks. Truth being left behind falls between the cracks. Standing on broken dreams, never losing sight. And in the end, on dreams we will depend. Because that's what love is made of. Right on. So what are the odds of actually capturing a blue OJ <laughs> sitting on the very railroad tracks where we started the love train? The abandoned tracks. And I think there is a message there as well. A link to connect. So one of the things we're doing in Second Life, we've actually bought a large parcel on the mainland by the Second Life Railroad that we want to, we're actually uh, recreating that station as you see there. And we want this to be like a really unique sandbox that invites people to be really creative, to use their imaginal cells and um, imagine, you know, reimagine reality, build things that, you know, uh, can inspire us to uh, build things in reality, you know. So I'm inviting everyone into this place and because I am not a master builder. But we would like to just really invite everybody to be a part of making it whatever it uh, is meant to be. And we have a virtual empire state building with a huge amount of space for meetings and exhibits and um, concerts. So we have Tesla's loft uh, for education on Nikola Tesla, which I also have connections to. And so if you, you know, have an interest in being involved, please get in touch with me um, because it really is about, you know, just bringing everybody together. And if you've ever seen the Lego movie, I was really inspired when I saw it by this, this quote of Emmett, the special. And of course, we were all special in our unique ways. Guys, you're all so talented and imaginative, but you can't work together as a team. I'm just a construction worker. But when I had a plan and we were all working together, I mean, we could build a skyscraper. Now you're master builders. Just imagine if you did that, you could save the universe. And I believe there's some real validity to that in reality and that we really need to consciously come together and collectively use our imaginal selves to transform reality as we know it at this time. So we're inviting everyone, builders, scripters, Calling all builders, scripters, artists, activists, educators, writers, filmmakers, philanthropists, dreamers, and visionaries on both sides of the screen. You don't have to come into the virtual world to be a part of the story. And in fact, Second Life is about to go mobile. So we'll have the, the uh, potential of really, uh, you know, inviting everyone into this, this growing interactive story uh, to help build nature's empire innovation station and a virtual love train on the second life railroad for a new creative cross-world collaborative story to reflect reality and write our future history so please everyone join us in that quest nature's empire really is about greening our our uh environment you know buildings are part of our environment and how can we make them more harmonious with nature um so we have a huge empire state building for for that purpose and uh, inviting everyone over to give us your ideas of what it can be. People all around the world, join hands, start a love train, and let's see where it takes us. See you in the new world. And that is actually Alex Simon, who's from Canton, Ohio, and Casey Wise who played on the love train, and uh, Alec played the stomp, in fact, if you've ever seen the uh, Broadway show Stomp. So we'll see you in the new world, and I thank you so much for allowing me to share this presentation, and we have uh, some video to close out our show.
Thank you. No, no, no.